everyone. In this episode of I Forgot to Ask the Doctor, I interview Dr. Edmund Eddy Osagi, complex endometriosis surgeon. We discuss many aspects of endometriosis, including symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment. Please have a listen. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to my podcast. On this, my first ever episode, I'm going to interview one of the first people that I met when I came to the UK 22 years ago. I was an SHO and he was my senior registrar. He's a highly skilled clinician and surgeon and also one of the nicest, kindest, most generous people you will ever hope to meet. Eddie is one of the leading lights of endometriosis and has presented nationally and internationally. He's well published and leads training in minimal access surgery in the northwest of England. He has trained some of our best young surgeons in gynecology and continues to provide training and at times support for other more junior consultants. Eddie, welcome. I feel it is so fitting that you are my first guest. Thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed. Thank you so much, Gail. It's an, it's an honor to be here and um, I, I, really, I really appreciate the honor of being your first guest on this wonderful podcast. Great. So, Eddie, endometriosis has had a bit of a light shone upon it recently in the press, and rightfully so, as it affects many people and can significantly impair quality of life. I see quite a few patients, for example, who come along saying that they think they might have it, so I thought it might be useful to have a discussion about it. First of all, let's talk about you for a few minutes. (laughs) Endometriosis surgery is one of the most challenging types of surgery in gynecology and across the board. Yeah. I'm really, really interested to learn what attracted you to this field. Thank you, Gail. And um, and again, I, I reiterate the point I made earlier that any opportunity for us to discuss endometriosis is, is an excellent opportunity because there is, as you rightly said, it affects so many women, but there's just so little we know about it and we're still scratching the surface of knowledge of the condition. So. So I really cherish this opportunity. Now, endometriosis is is, um, is an enigma. And I remember when I was training, um, I was very, very interested in reproductive health of women. Uh, and so I actually got into doing the reproductive medicine side of reproductive health first. And so the IVF infertility and all of that. And it became clear to me that a lot of the women I was seeing were women who had endometriosis and endometriosis was impacting significantly on not just mm-hmm. the chances of achieving natural conception, but on the chances of the IVF that we're offering them. And at the same time, causing significant compromise to their quality of life. Uh, and I remember I worked with a really brilliant laparoscopic surgeon at St. Mary's Hospital then, um, Tony Smith. Uh, and, uh, and I discussed it with him and Tony said, look, Eddie, this is just crying out for you to get into because there's no one who is doing, you know, laparoscopic work for these women in this region. And Tony talked me into developing an interest in it. And since then, I haven't looked back. And um, he he actually started my training in laparoscopic surgery before I went to London and a few other places to get some more advanced training. So that's how I got into it. And the more I delved into it, the more I found that there was just a need, you know, and they said, as they said, yeah. the, 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 the need is a call, you know, and, and because there are very few people who were actually catering to the needs of these women, uh, I just felt it was my calling and, and I, I haven't looked back since. Mm, well, thank you. So, so basically one of the leading lights and pioneers of urogynecology, Professor Tony Smith <laughs> has engendered, given us a leading light to pioneer in endometriosis. That's fantastic. That's a fantastic legacy. So the main purpose of this podcast is to reach patients. We as doctors, as you know, we spend a lot of time educating each other. We go to conferences, we go to meetings, we talk about conditions, but ironically, the time that patients have with us can be quite limited. Yeah. So we are going to speak plainly today, Eddie. We're not going to use any of that language we learned in medical school. And we don't even notice creeping into our own 
turn of phrase in our own conversation. We're going to go right back to basics. Yeah. For the benefit of those who know absolutely nothing about it, what exactly is endometriosis? Is it something that we are born with? Or is it something that people develop over time? That, that's a really good question. And I think it's really important for um, women to begin to understand endometriosis. But before we actually delve into the condition, I think it will be helpful to just explain very, very briefly how a woman's body works in terms of, you know, yeah. um, what, what happens during the normal menstrual cycle. Um, so mm -hmm. when women get to the age of, where they start to, the reproductive age, where they start to have periods, what happens normally puberty. is that the puberty, the brain kicks in and starts to stimulate the ovaries and the ovaries grow eggs. And as they grow in those eggs, they produce hormones that make the lining of the womb to develop. And, uh, and, and that's every month that happens. And the way nature has designed it, if a pregnancy doesn't occur, then that lining of the womb that has developed is shared and that's what women shared as a period every month and that happens yeah. month after month after month uh, and we know that during that period of shedding of the lining of the womb a little amount of the blood that is passed passes through the tubes the fallopian tubes of a woman back into the pelvis and ordinarily in the normal scheme of things the body just mops it up and it's not a problem at all but in um a few women um, something happens. Um, we do not know exactly what happens, but we're beginning to understand a lot more about how, um, how it happens. We think that some women are born with a genetic predisposition to develop a mm -hmm. condition called endometriosis. Uh, and that genetic predisposition m affects the way their immune system works um, so that the immune system doesn't work as, um, as well in those women regarding certain things as in women who do not have that genetic predisposition. So for instance, in those women, that little bit of blood that is shed and passes through the tubes into the pelvis, that other, or women who do not have that genetic predisposition can mop up by themselves. In women who have that genetic predisposition to endometriosis, um, their immune system doesn't allow them to get rid of those cells. So what happens in those women is that those cells contain the cells that come from the lining of the womb and they start to attach to the pelvic organs because they are not destroyed. They start to attach to the pelvic yeah. organs. And over time, as a woman goes through her normal menstrual cycle, where she develops her eggs and builds up her hormones, those cells that are outside the womb also start to develop. Uh, and they get to a state where as the woman is shedding the normal lining of the womb that she sheds every month and has a period, those cells that have mm -hmm. developed outside of the womb are also shed. So they start to bleed and they bleed into the tummy. Uh, and that is generally what causes the inflammation and what causes the pain. And in the past, okay. we used to think we used to think that endometriosis was um, a pelvic condition that just occurred in the pelvis. But we have since moved away from that line of thought now. And we now believe that endometriosis is a systemic condition that affects the whole body. But it just has particular manifestations in different parts of the body. So we think it's a systemic inflammatory condition. Uh, and that's why some women with endometriosis will present with just feeling unwell when they are going through um, flare-ups of the condition. Some women will present with actually having flu-like symptoms. Uh, some women might actually have a temperature. Yeah, some women will actually have a temperature. And that's the whole systemic inflammatory um, nature of the condition kicking in. Uh, but we do appreciate that in a lot of women, a lot of the manifestation is in the pelvis. Okay. So therefore, if there's a big genetic component, is it really common to have a family history? 
you know, uh, women who have a, a whose mom or auntie or whatever has endometriosis, are they more likely to have endometriosis? Very, very much so. So if a woman has endometriosis, then her sisters or um, her daughters um, have a tenfold increased risk of actually developing endometriosis. So that's a really useful thing for people to know so that if they have endometriosis, mm -hmm. Absolutely. then it's a good thing for them to be mindful that if they've got younger sisters or they've got daughters, that their daughters are at Different. increased risk. It, it's not invariable, it's not invariable that, in, in, that they will get it, but they are at increased risk of mm -hmm. getting it. Uh, and so when you have that sort of history, what we advise is that at the earliest signs that something might be wrong, it's good to get 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 it looked at uh, because with, like everything else, the earlier we pick these conditions up, the easier they are to manage, um, the better the outcomes when we manage them, and the less they impact the quality of life of the woman who's affected. So you'd encourage women to go along pretty early if they suspect that they might have endometriosis. Absolutely, absolutely. And is there any evidence of a relationship between any other inflammatory or autoimmune conditions? For example, diabetes, or do you see that? Do you see, or having a family history or personal history, are they at greater risk or is that, are we not clear about that yet, as yet? We're, we're not very clear about that, about those associations. But what we do find sometimes is that um, in families where things like endometriosis run, we also find that um, they, they can have a greater risk of having what we call autoimmune conditions, meaning conditions that can affect the immune system through um, the, right. the, um, the antibodies and things and the immune cells that are produced. Yeah. So endometriosis yeah. tends to run, yeah, um, um, tends to have a greater endurance, yeah, in those sorts of families. Okay, okay. So, so, so probably the most, um, the symptom that people are most aware of that's caused by endometriosis, I guess, would be pelvic pain. And I see many patients who come along and say, I have pelvic pain, I think I have endometriosis. What are the symptoms of endometriosis? Are there any other symptoms that may occur apart from pelvic pain to make the diagnosis of endometriosis more likely? Or conversely, are there any other symptoms that may point away from the diagnosis of endometriosis in a patient with pelvic pain and towards an alternative explanation for her symptoms? That's a really good question. Um, as I said earlier, we now believe that endometriosis is a systemic condition. So um, mm -hmm. in the past, we used to think that the only manifestation of endometriosis was pelvic pain, but we know that that's mm -hmm. not true. We know that these uh, women mm -hmm. who are affected by endometriosis can present with a myriad of um, symptoms that are sometimes called comorbidities, um, all the way from, I described some generalized ones like fever, malaise, extreme fatigue. Some, some of them can be so fatigued that during periods they're just unable to do anything at all. Um, um, to generalize body pains and aches. And sometimes th th um, these women have been um, 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 thought to have fi fibromyalgia. Uh, I was just going to say there's probably misdiagnosis sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But yes, the, the, the most common manifestation of endometriosis is pain. And that makes sense because mm -hmm. it's an inflammatory condition. Yeah. And where a lot of that inflammation takes place is in the pelvis. So we do find that in the very early stages when women develop endometriosis, they tend to develop pain around their menstrual periods because of what I described earlier about the bleeding from the endometriotic cells that are outside of the yes. womb. And that causes inflammation yeah. in the pelvis that leads to pain. But as the condition yeah. progresses, that pain, they might start to have pain around ovulation time. And, right. and again, as the condition progresses, they might get to a stage where they have pain all through the cycle. So the predominant symptom is pain. And that pain can be um, quite debilitating for some women to the point where during periods, some women are just unable to go to work. So they miss work. Um, young girls are unable to go to school. They miss school. Yeah. Um, and um, um, 
yeah, and that can really impact on their productivity and, and the opportunities they have. The other things that women experience with endometriosis, um, all the other organs in the pelvis, so the bladder can be affected. So women can experience frequent passage of urine. So sometimes one of the common things that we hear from women who have endometriosis when they come to us is that they have repeated urinary tract infections and they've been to their GP several times. They've been treated with repeated courses of antibiotics. The infection doesn't go away. And whenever they have a period, they have another infection. And that's a, a giveaway that it's likely that yeah. that is likely inflammation affecting the bladder rather than an infection. Um, and it can also affect their bowel. So um, about 40% of women who have endometriosis have some sort of bowel dysfunction where they can have um, fluctuations in their stool consistency. So their stool from one day could move from having constipation to having very loose stools to having frank diarrhea. Uh, and as, it, as the condition progresses, um, it can um, give rise to very painful bowel motions. Uh, and some women can pass blood in stool. So those are some of the um, um, some of the um, symptoms women present with. But, but as I said, there are a myriad of just generalized things. The one thing, the one, the the, the one message I would um, ask women to take away from this is, if they have symptoms that are occurring cyclically around period time or around ovulation time, and then easing outside of those times. Uh, then they got to think about endometriosis. And it's not normal for you to miss work. It's not normal for you to miss school because you're having a period. If your periods are preventing you from doing your normal duties and going to school, from socializing, there's something wrong. And the most likely thing is endometriosis. And can endometriosis affect relationships? Absolutely. And sex? Absolutely. Um, and what, what, again, a, a, a quite common presentation that we, uh, we find with women is painful sex. Uh, and there are different things that can give rise to painful sex, all the way from pelvic infections, like from STDs to, um, um, to endometriosis, to other conditions like fibroids. But yeah. the, ty the type yeah. of painful sex women have from endometriosis is quite specific. Uh, and that's painful sex that they feel on deep penetration. Uh, and the reason that occurs is during deep penetration, the part of the vagina that is um, irritated um, is where the endometriotic deposits usually are. So that's why that is a very particular type of painful sex. And uh, women who are experiencing that, again, that's a... Um, a giveaway sign that there is something. Giveaway yeah. Okay. So I guess in, in addition to women being maybe misdiagnosed or ending up in different clinics for fatigue, malaise, et cetera, et cetera, I guess women may also end up seeing gastroenterologists because of the bowel symptoms. Bowel symptoms can be quite prominent or urologists, yeah. you know, so it's just important to have an open mind really. Absolutely. Um, as regards any symptoms in the pelvis or even generalized symptoms. Absolutely. Okay, that's really, really interesting. So can you walk me through? So so I say, I think, oh, I may have endometriosis and um, I've listened to this podcast and I think, yes, I want to seek attention. I want an answer um, because you have suggested, recommended that women go early yeah. um, to seek help. Can you walk me through how their diagnosis of endometriosis is usually made? So what can patients expect? Again, that, that, that's a really good question. Um, in I would say in maybe about three quarters of, of women who come to see us, and just talking to them, you have a sense that there's a likelihood of endometriosis here. So when they describe yeah. the cyclical symptoms, cyclical pain, and mm -hmm. all the other symptoms associated mm -hmm. with it, maybe affecting the bladder, the bowel, painful sex, um, all those are giveaway signs. And from our perspective, there are very, very simple things that we can do to help to make 
that impression of endometriosis. Um, so one, anybody who, uh, any doctor, any gynecologist who is experienced in dealing with this condition can do a simple pelvic examination on women who, um, who are able to tolerate pelvic examinations. And there are signs that we can pick up that give us an indication of whether that woman has endometriosis and can actually give us an indication of how severe the endometriosis is in a, in a, in a particular patient. Um, mm -hmm. And then we use things like ultrasound scans. So transvaginal scanning can, again, give us an idea of a, a, the type of endometriosis the woman has. And I think I'll come back to that, that um, later on, if I may, Gail, because I think it's um, it, important for women to understand that there are different types of endometriosis yeah. and they can all present yeah. with different um, different things. Uh, mm -hmm. and in most severe cases, we can do things like MRI scans to better understand mm -hmm. what organs have been affected by the endometriosis. And all of those tools, all of those investigative tools help us in planning the right treatment approach for any particular woman. But ultimately, the gold standard and the only way we can categorically say anybody has endometriosis, unfortunately, it's still to do a surgical procedure called the laparoscopy, or some people would know it as keyhole surgery, where we give a general anesthetic, put a camera through the belly button into the pelvis yeah. to see the lesions for ourselves uh, and make the diagnosis. And we can take the opportunity to treat the lesions at the same time. And so when a patient, you, you mentioned, when a patient comes and they're in the clinical situation, they're in clinic, you take a history, you um, get all the information from the patient, and then you do an examination in appropriate women, do an examination. Um, some women don't like to, or don't necessarily like, or a bit embarrassed maybe, to be examined when they're on a period. Do you have anything to say about that? Do you think that is a beneficial thing? You know, I, I personally always say I'm a gynecologist and you being on a period absolutely doesn't, you know, I have no issue with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And is, absolutely. is it any better? There's a, there's a certain theory that it's better to examine a woman when she's on a period because that's the time when the endometriosis is more likely to be active. Is that what you have found? Um, when, when I started training about maybe, I mean, a few decades ago, that was that was the thinking then, and that was what were thoughts. Um, but mm -hmm. over time, I have changed my mind, and because some some women are so uncomfortable during periods, you know, that even mm -hmm. trying to examine them, you, you just you know, yeah. they're going to scream their heads off and jump off the couch where right, trying to examine them on. And mm -hmm. um, as I've gotten more experience in dealing with this condition, I know that. Whatever I can feel during a period, I can also feel outside of a period. Okay. Um, so um, it doesn't Does necessarily it make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, and I would say it really depends on how uncomfortable the woman is and if and how, how, how comfortable they are to be examined during periods. There are some women who choose yeah. not to and they'll prefer to come yeah. back. And I'm totally okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. And where some women don't mind at all. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And can you talk, you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, can you tell me a bit more detail about how the severity of the condition can vary from patient to patient? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And before before, before I, I, I just delve into the severity, I, I, I would like to just explain the different types of endometriosis as well, because that impacts on the okay. severity. Um, um, so in the past, we used to just think that, as I said, endometriosis was just a pelvic condition. We found it on the, the walls of the pelvis and that was it. Uh, but we now know that endometriosis encompasses a lot of, you know, different conditions that we, um, that can arise in different ways and can give rise to different predominant symptoms. So for instance, the, the common one that everybody knows about is the peritoneal endometriosis. The peritoneum is the lining of the pelvis. And when you have spots of endometriosis on the peritoneum, that's what we refer to as peritoneal endometriosis. That's probably the most common. And that's probably mm -hmm. the one that we think originates from um, the menstrual blood that passes through the tubes and gets deposited on that lining. But there are other types. So endometriosis can find its way into the ovaries 
and form cysts in the ovaries, and we call those endometriomas. Um, and uh, and those uh, th those can present, uh, you know, in um, in different ways, and those can have a significantly greater impact on fertility because they can affect the eggs. Unfortunately, they can damage the eggs in the ovaries, and they can significantly impact on women's fertility. And if the cyst gets really big, they can um, cause all sorts of acute problems. They can rupture, they can bleed, um, they can get twisted, uh, and those will cause all sorts of um, acute problems for the woman. Uh, and then there is the endometriosis that gets deep into the tissues that we refer to as a deeply infiltrating endometriosis. Uh, and some, some people might know them as rectovaginal disease. Uh, and those are the more severe forms where the endometriosis actually forms big nodules inside the tissues. And the typical place you find those sorts of endometriotic lesions are in the tissues between the vagina in front and the rectum behind. And because endometriosis is what we call a proliferative inflammatory condition, it can spread and affect those organs. So it can affect the rectum uh, and that can be a significant cause of rectal problems. It can affect the um, the vagina, uh, and and again that can be a significant cause of um, coital difficulties for women. And unfortunately, there are some women with those conditions who just cannot engage in sex because it's just so so painful. So talking about the severity, um, for want for want of a better system, we tend to grade endometriosis into four stages of the disease. Um, so we have the, um, the minimal, the mild, the moderate, and the severe. Uh, and there are different things we look at in terms of where the endometriosis is located, how widespread the lesions are, how deep they go into the tissues to determine what stage of severity um, the disease is at. Um, but the one thing I would say is what we have found is that the severity of the disease actually doesn't correlate very well with symptoms women have. So you can find somebody who has what we would class as minimal or mild disease, who is moribund from pain and they just cannot cope with the pain they're experiencing. And at other times we find people who have florid disease, what we would class as stage four disease, severe disease, and they are completely painless. So that's the enigma of endometriosis, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. for, from our perspective, it helps us to classify them into these different stages. But from the perspective of the person, the woman who's suffering with endometriosis, uh, those stages do not directly correlate to um, how much pain they're experiencing or how much they're suffering. So basically, just to recap, the endometriosis can basically be affect three places, the skin of the pelvis, yep. peritoneal endometriosis, the ovaries, or deep into the tissues. Deep into the tissues. And as a complex advanced laparoscopic surgeon, I'm guessing you're a deep into the tissues guy, whereas not everybody will be, will, um, will attack those complex surgeries. They and actually, as you know, I, I, I came to see you in theatre today and quite fittingly, you were doing an operation on, <laughs> for complex endometriosis and you had um, junior, a junior consultant with you. So, so, um, so thanks for joining, even though you've had a long theatre today. And, and, and these operations can be very prolonged and complicated, can't they? And they can last for hours, can't they? They can. They can, they can be very, very um, um, prolonged and complicated. And, and one of the uh, endometriosis, the, the most severe endometriosis cases can, the, the surgery for those can be technically quite challenging. Uh, and mm -hmm. that's because endometriosis is an inflammatory condition. So it causes a lot of inflammatory changes with a lot of um, um, fibrosis. Fibrosis is when the tissues get really, really stiff and tough and difficult to cut through. Uh, and they can involve other organs. So when we generally yeah. treat endometriosis, what we're looking to do is to get rid of the endometriotic lesions but not cause any damage to the healthy tissues that we, we want to leave behind. But with endometriosis, because of the inflammatory nature, they get really stuck to those healthy tissues and that will, that's what makes the surgery very challenging. 
But yeah. what I would okay. say is um, we have developed very safe techniques of doing these surgeries, even for the most complex cases. Uh, and sometimes we have to work with um, our colorectal surgery colleagues to, mm -hmm. to deal with cases that have gone into the bowel or our urology colleagues to deal with cases that have gone into, into the bladder, into the ureters. Uh, but all those things, we do have good techniques for dealing with them. The one point I will make is uh, it is really important that people understand the um, um, understand that the the very severe cases need a lot of expertise, and women who yeah. have those severe degrees of endometriosis should ensure that they are going to centres that are recognised yeah. for that yeah, expertise. Uh, in the UK. The, the British Society of Gynae Endoscopies badge centers as endometriosis centers, and those centers are badged because they do have the expertise to provide such treatment for those women. And multidisciplinary as well. Absolutely. Yeah, as you, as you mentioned before. So apart from surgery, which I guess um, is uh, a last resort, I suppose, or last option, um, are there any other medical, for example, treatments that can be effective before proceeding to surgery? Uh, absolutely. What are, the, what are the options? What are the options? Absolutely. So if, again, if we go back to the, the uh, understanding of endometriosis, that is a systemic inflammatory condition. So a, 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 a significant proportion of the symptoms that women have are actually because of the inflammation. So anything that targets inflammation will help to reduce the discomfort <laughs> exactly so any any um anti-inflammatory painkillers so a tip, common example is a non-steroidal so things like ibuprofen naproxen those are really quite helpful in managing the pain and inflammation associated with endometriosis um the other thing is endometriosis is a hormonally driven condition so um and just to explain what I mean by that, it's uncommon to find endometriosis outside of the reproductive years of a woman. So um, it's uncommon to find it before puberty when girls start to have periods and it's uncommon to find it developing for the first time after the menopause when women have stopped having periods. So most of endometriosis develops and, and that's because uh, it's primarily driven by a hormone called estrogen that is produced from a woman's ovaries. So part of the treatment that we have is to counteract that hormone. Um, and so we have different medications that we can use to do that. We have like the combined contraceptive pill or the progesterone only contraceptive pill. Those are quite helpful in counteracting the um, effect of estrogen and they can help to control symptoms of endometriosis, particularly the pain symptoms and make life comfortable for women. Uh, and in certain more severe cases, um, we have medication that we can use to shut the ovaries down so that they stop producing estrogens completely. Um, and we call that inducing a medical menopause. Uh, and that's a very, very useful, um, useful treatment for a lot of women. Um, albeit a temporary treatment until something more definitive like surgery um, um, happens. And there are some women to whom that sounds horrific <laughs> in its own right, um, being plunged into menopause. Yeah. Uh, what 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 can you say? Because it 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 can be you, you've just said it can be a really valuable adjunct to treatment. Um, how do women, how do women react to it? How do women, you know, what's the feedback from women who have been on this treatment, even as a temporary measure while they're awaiting surgery? You're absolutely right. Uh, the first time we introduce it to women, they think it's horrific and nobody wants to go from being, you know, um, um healthy, yeah. fertile with the estrogens to a menopausal state with all the side effects that that will um, bring with it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, we recognize that as well. And what we do is that in addition to using those hormones to shut the ovaries down, we provide um, HRT 
which is a form of mild estrogen replacement, which will ameliorate all the um, menopausal symptoms, but not okay. in not in big enough amounts to stimulate the endometriosis to keep developing. Uh, and there are okay. some women where we find that their lives are just completely taken over by pain and by the other symptoms. Sometimes it's just the fatigue, it's just the malaise, the migraines, all the, all the other things are associated with endometriosis. And some people just cannot function. And the only way we can actually give them their lives back is to shut their ovaries down temporarily. These are not yeah. permanent treatments, they're temporary treatments. Yeah. And usually when we've explained it like that and we have reassured women that we have um, HRT that can ameliorate the menopausal symptoms, they are more receptive to it. So, and so definitely, you know, more or less in most people, the benefits outweigh the risks, which Absolutely. is what we're always looking. We're always looking at that balance in medicine, aren't we? You Absolutely. Know, does the benefit outweigh the risk? Absolutely. Are there any other modalities of treatment that are available? There are new things. There are new things. Oils or yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, yeah, absolutely. So the 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 uh, the progesterone coils like the Marina, the Kylina, those are quite useful for treating endometriosis. And when I was talking mm -hmm. about the types of endometriosis, what I didn't mention was there's a type of endometriosis that actually affects the womb. So these are where endometriotic cells invade the womb, and this is called adenomyosis. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. for that condition, things like the, the, the progesterone coils are very, very effective uh, in managing those symptoms. Um, and they are sitting right where it is. Absolutely, sitting right where it is, mm -hmm. and the women are not needing mm -hmm. to take medication every day, you know, and they can yeah. just go about their lives and be comfortable. Uh, and yeah, there are some yeah. there are, there, are, there are some new drugs coming out in the market now, uh, and one that is is um, um, uh, we are quite excited about. Is, there are two actually that we're excited about: um, the progesterone receptor modulators. So these are these are drugs that act like progesterones that can counteract the effects of estrogens and reduce inflammation and so manage endometriosis, but they do not have some of the side effects that progesterone hormones have. So meaning we can right. use them and women get the benefits of them, but they can avoid some of the side effects of progesterone pills, like, you know, all the, the things they cause like mood changes and irregular mm -hmm. bleeding and those sorts of things. So those are- Rest and water absolutely. retention and stuff. Absolutely. So mm -hmm. that, that's very exciting. Um, the other very exciting thing is the, um, the injections I talked about that can shut a woman's ovaries down. Um, they've actually, we, um, there have been new developments now where there is actually a pill that is a milder form of that injection. And that pill can achieve the same thing without all the horrendous menopausal symptoms. Um, the only drawback is that it's new, it's expensive, and um, well, it works really well. But we think that those will really give us more um, um, options um, to yeah. offer our women. Great. And can you give us an idea of the success rates in treating women of these various modalities, medical versus surgery, for example? Yeah, they're, uh, they're, they're quite helpful. They're quite helpful. And uh, what we usually look at um, uh, the symptoms the women have predominantly, uh, and a big part of what we look at is um, what their fertility aspirations are in the short yeah. and in the long term. Uh, and I mentioned that because, unfortunately, a lot of the things that are available for us to treat endometriosis, because of the very nature of the condition that is hormonally based, uh, are also things that can impact on fertility. And because endometriosis is a condition that is commonest during the reproductive years, a lot of the women who come to see us with endometriosis are also trying to conceive. I'll give um, just a simple statistic. We think, although we're not very, very certain, we think that maybe about one in 10 women, generally, maybe 10% of the population have endometriosis. But when you come to a population of women who have difficulty conceiving, 
we find endometriosis in about 40% of them. So mm -hmm. quite a significant proportion of those women suffer with endometriosis. And unfortunately, a lot of these medical treatments that I've talked about will not be of much help to them because those women want to be rid of the endometriosis, they want to be rid of the pain, but they also want to conceive. So in those women, um, the most appropriate... The pill and the oil, because they're, they're contraceptive, I guess. Contraceptive, exactly. They're just not options, are they? They're, they're just not options. So in those women, we're left with a surgical option, and that's generally mm -hmm. what, what we offer them. But yeah, um, all of the treatments we've talked about are um, reasonably effective. So things like the progesterone-only pill, um, the, uh, the combined pill, um, those are usually used, we usually use those to manage pain uh, um, um, in women, especially cyclical pain. Uh, and those are effective in about 60% of cases we use them for. So reasonably e effective. And if they're combined with things like the non-steroidals, like ibuprofen, naproxen, then that effectiveness um, um, goes even higher. Um, but as I said earlier, um, the most definitive way of getting rid of endometriosis uh, and the most successful way of managing it is by taking the lesions away surgically. So if a woman, maybe um, a relatively young woman, um, comes along and either thinks she has or she has symptoms of endometriosis, sometimes um, she may be placed on the pill, for example, to yeah. see if that affects her symptoms in a positive manner. Perhaps she doesn't have time, it's not a right time in her life or job or school to have surgery. So it may be that these, these options may be used. I think some patients are particularly concerned about the risk of masking something in the shorter term that will continue to progress in the longer term and cause them greater difficulty than if they had addressed it in the first place. Does that make sense, that question? Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that a concern that, um, is that a realistic concern or is it that if the pill is treating it, it will arrest it and it, it won't be progressing in the background? And, you know, for the most part, I know nothing is 100%, sure. but, you know, should women be worried about going on the pill, even if it treats their symptoms, because later on, you know, the problem might be greater. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it is a valid concern. It is a valid concern because the, the hormonal preparations we use, the non-steroidals, they do not um, stop the endometriosis okay. from progressing. So what they do is that they, they help us to manage the symptoms of endometriosis. Um, so they reduce pain, um, they reduce the inflammatory effects of endometriosis. So in terms of the condition, uh, the condition can keep progressing. So, so, so in a sense, yes, it could be that um, you're managing the pain and the symptoms now, but the condition is progressing and getting more severe. But the caveat to that is that we still don't fully understand the natural history of endometriosis uh, because you can take 10 different people and study them over a course of 10 years. And in some of those people, without any treatment, their endometriosis will not progress at all. And in other people, it will progress. So we, there's still, you know, a gap in our knowledge as to what is causing this condition to progress and um, what can we do to retard that progression. Um, we still struggling to find out. But the only things that will really stop endometriosis from progressing um, are things that will shut down the production of estrogens. So if we if you right. switch if you switch estrogens off, the endometriosis will become inactive, it will not progress anymore. It will not get rid of the lesions that are there, but they will not get any worse. Okay. Very very interesting. Excellent. Okay. Um, so you, you've told us about the new emerging uh, medications that can be used for endometriosis. Um, are there any new emerging surgical techniques? What about, how do you feel about robotic surgery, things like that? Not in detail, but 
just to give people a, an idea of what's on the horizon? Yeah, that, it, it, it is interesting. Um, I mean, uh, surgery for endometriosis is evolving all the time. Um, I, I can recall when, when I started getting interested in this um, over 20 years ago, um, for most cases of severe endometriosis, the option available to us then was to do a hysterectomy, remove the tubes, remove the ovaries and remove everything. You know, but we are at a stage now where we can be ultra conservative with our um, our interventions, and you know, uh, and we went through a phase where we're very very aggressive in removing bowel, in removing bits of bladder, and all sorts of things that were affected. Uh, but now we do a lot of what we call um, just shaving these conditions off and preserving the integrity of those other tissues. So that's something that I have witnessed over the over the years, and and I think that's a really yeah. good thing, because the less aggressive we are with these interventions, the better the, I feel the outcome yeah, is, and the, the 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 lower the risk of complications are uh, for these women mm -hmm. who go through them. So that's a good thing, and you mentioned robotics. I'll just address robotics very very um briefly. Yeah. Uh, robotic surgery is coming in a big way, and I think it's. It's inevitable that it comes to every um, every specialty in medicine. Um, what we what what we feel is that robotics will be helpful for the very very complex cases where we spend a lot of time. Sometimes we do endometriosis surgery for eight hours because it's affected the bowel, it's affected the kidneys, it's affected the bladder, and we're operating on all of these organs. And when you're operating that long, you know, um, it can you get tired. take its toll on you. Exactly. And the more tired yeah. you get, the less precise your surgical skills are. So we think that yeah. robotics will be helpful for those sorts of cases. Um, robotics have not so far been shown to be uh, of significant benefit for the straightforward, mild to moderate endometriosis. Uh, and uh, usual standard laparoscopic approach um, is still just as good for those. Okay. And after surgery, what is the is there a recurrence risk of it coming back uh, as women will continue to have periods? Absolutely. I, I think that's really important for women to know, uh, and mm. that we cannot cure endometriosis. We we um, we just first of all. We don't know exactly why it starts in the first place. And so a lot of the tools we have are to help women to um, cope with either the symptoms or to get rid of the lesions at the time where we pick them up. So we can go in and remove the lesions, but we cannot say endometriosis will not come back in future because as long as um, a woman is within the reproductive age, as long as her ovaries are still producing estrogens, as long as she's still having periods, then there is a risk that she can develop endometriosis in the future. And what the studies tell us um, is that um, of the women who we operate on and remove their endometriosis, um, up to between 25 and 40 percent of them will have a recurrence of endometriosis within five years. So um, we feel the more severe the case, the greater the likelihood of recurrence, although it, it doesn't follow. We, we think the genetic predisposition plays a role as well. But I always say um, what the studies are also telling us is that 60% of women do not have a recurrence within five years. And, you know, and uh, so we always try and do the best job by getting rid of the endometriosis and making sure we remove all of the lesions. And that's why we do excision surgery for most of our women and do what we call a total peritoneal excision because we feel that gives us the best chance of getting rid of the lesions and minimizing the risk of them coming back. But after surgery, there are things we can do to reduce the risk of recurrence. So we can use the combined pill, the progesterone only pill, the marina coil, uh, all of those hormonal preparations, they help us uh, we, we call them secondary preventive measures. They help us to reduce the risk of the endometriosis coming back. Okay. So they can be used before or after surgery. Absolutely, yeah. 
And is there anything that women can do to reduce recurrence, even getting it or it recurring? Is there anything that women can do to affect outcomes? Uh, unfortunately, uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a great deal a woman can do to stop herself getting endometriosis. Uh, the truth of the matter is that if a woman has a genetic predisposition and she gets to the age of puberty, then it's more than likely that it's just a matter of time before she gets it. But what women can do is to understand how their bodies work. And once they start to get symptoms that are not usual for them, so cyclical pain during periods that are difficult to manage and impacting on your quality of life and work and socializing uh, or severe pain during ovulation uh, or painful sex that's beginning to impact on you being able to, you know, consummate your relationships. Yeah. Those things are not normal. Yeah. And once women start to get those, then they can look into them um, because the sooner we get to endometriosis lesions, um, the easier it is to treat and the better the outcome and we feel the risk of complication, uh, the risk of complications and the risk of recurrence is, is also less. Okay. So does, of course you're a fertility specialist and you've, you've mentioned it already. Um, does, what is, does surgery improve fertility? Surgery improves fertility. Improves fertility. So, um, so there are two, um, there are two reasons yeah, two, why we do surgery reasons. for women with endometriosis. One is to relieve them of pain. And the second reason is to improve fertility. So there are really, really good studies that show that endometriosis undertaking for women who have mild to moderate disease um, improves their chances of conceiving naturally. Uh, and even with IVF, so for, for women who have mild to moderate disease, even when it hasn't affected the fallopian tubes and caused blockage of the tubes, it can impact on their chances of conceiving naturally because of different things, some enzymes that are secreted into the, into the pelvis. Uh, and when we do surgery to remove those lesions, we remove those negative impacts on fertility and um, their chances of conceiving actually improve. We find, we find the same beneficial effects for women who are undergoing IVF. Uh, and we think, we think that that um, negative impact of endometriosis is on the development of a lining of the womb uh, and it affects the way that happens. And once we remove those lesions and all the inf inflammatory, um, 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 all the inflammation around them, then we improve the chances of IVF working in those women. So surgery improves fertility, definitely. So, so the pelvis is just basically a happier place. Absolutely. We like to say we make it a more conducive environment for pregnancy to take place. Okay. So, for example, a patient who has been diagnosed incidentally, maybe with an endometriotic cyst of the ovary, has no symptoms, but also has no children and would like children in the future, I know it's difficult not to put you on the spot, but would you say, wait, or would you say, you know, get it while it's reasonably sized and the surgery will be less complicated? But that's a really good even question. If she's, even if she has no symptoms. That's a really good question because, and this is where our knowledge and our understanding of endometriosis and how to help women evolves over time. If you had asked me this same question five years ago, I would have said, jump in there, get rid of it, and even if she has no symptoms. But we, we, we now know that for those women, um, it's actually best not to do anything and to encourage them to just carry on. Uh, and it's only if they develop, you know, symptoms, you know, or the, endometriosis starts to impact on their fertility journey that uh, we intervene. So you'd say try for a pregnancy. Absolutely. And if, if they turn up, if it's not successful, then that's a 
Exactly. Something that can be done to hopefully improve their fertility. Exactly, yeah? yeah. Okay. So back to um, your neck of the woods, severe endometriosis, mm -hmm. which often requires very complicated, as you've mentioned before, prolonged complex surgery with significant, you know, risk, significant risks. Yeah. Um, this, you know, we can't get away from the fact that it's a benign, meaning it's not a cancerous condition. What do you think, as an expert who deals with this every day, what do you think patients should consider when making that decision to proceed with complicated surgery? And what guidance do you give your patients? That's a, that's a really good question, Gail. Um, I do find, unfortunately, that the, with the more severe endometriosis cases, um, the impact it has on people's quality of life just makes takes away the choice from them if you know what i mean um, a lot a lot of the women who come to see me have no quality of life a lot of the women who come to see me cannot engage in intercourse you know mm -hmm. um people are more reborn for three to four days every month because they every just cannot month. get out of bed yeah uh, some you know so unfortunately when you are at that stage of the journey with endometriosis you don't really have the choice anymore. It's not a decision. Yeah, Absolutely. the choice has been taken away from you. You've got, you've got to just deal with it. And the only way we can really deal with it, you know, definitively in those women is to go in there and excise the lesions. Um, at the earlier stages, you know, where you're talking about mild to moderate disease, I think that's where choice comes in. Uh, and that's right. where I always say it really depends on how much this is impacting on you uh, and especially for younger ladies who come to us, you know, um, we say if it's not causing a significant impact, then it's probably reasonable to consider managing it through other means, using hormones, you know, and using medical means to manage it initially. Um, yeah. Because unfortunately, there is a risk of endometriosis coming back. And what you do not want to end up is having a surgical Multiple. procedure every, every other year, you know, from a very early age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, lastly from me, what effect does the menopause have on endometriosis? So, perhaps women have been diagnosed, because some women are diagnosed surprisingly late, aren't they? Yep. Um, and if they're considering whether to go down an invasive route for treatment, but then on the other hand, they think, well, actually, the menopause might be just two years away or yeah. whatever, one year away. What impact does that have on endometriosis? You, you alluded, you, you mentioned before that endometriosis is hormone dependent and menopause, obviously, you know, there's no estrogen or very little circulating estrogen. So what can women expect to happen to their endometriosis symptoms? That's a really good question. And yes. Uh, endometriosis is very, very hormone dependent. And if you switch off hormones, if you switch off estrogens, which is what occurs at menopause, then we expect that you will switch off the inflammatory stimulus and, you know, and you stop getting that inflammation. And that happens to the vast majority of women. So women, when they go through the menopause, they'll notice a significant decrease in their symptoms. And for some women, uh, they they will not need any further intervention. Um, right. But and the the other thing I would say is um, I haven't seen any. Um, there are very rare instances where we will diagnose endometriosis for the first time after the menopause. Usually, we can mm -hmm. treat endometriosis during the menopause, but usually there are women who have it's developed before they get to the menopause, and then it's carried on. Um, but sadly, we do have um, some women who will continue to have symptoms after the menopause. Uh, and initially, uh, again, uh, I would have said, if you asked me this five years ago, I'd have given you a different answer because then we didn't fully understand what was going on. But we now know that, unfortunately, the nature of endometriotic tissues outside the womb that give rise to all of this inflammation and cause endometriosis is very different from the tissues inside the womb that 
women develop and shed every cycle. Mm -hmm. So what we now know is that those endometriotic cells outside the womb, some of them can actually start to produce small amounts of estrogen themselves. And that self perpetuates that inflammatory stimulus within them. Process. And, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and we think that this might be something that works in some women who carry on having problems with endometriosis after the menopause. Uh, and unfortunately in those women, um, they will still need intervention of one form or the other. But fortunately, um, it's a very small proportion of women who are that affected. And do you want to just give us a quick little, because the, the, you know, the obvious question on everybody's mind is now, what about HRT? Anything um, to say about HRT? And I'm sure I will speak to a menopause specialist at some point in this podcast, but if you wanted the good, to the good, the good say thing a about, word. The good thing about HRT is that we think that the amount of hormones in HRT um, is low. For some reason, um, is not at the threshold where it induces that inflammatory um, 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 reaction or response from, um, from the endometriotic tissues. And, and we know this because of the women we induce menopause in uh, and we give them HRT and those women have been studied uh, and it's quite clear that the HRT doesn't get the endometriosis back to a level where they start to um, um, cause inflammatory um, symptoms again. So, so yes, HRT is, HRT is safe with endometriosis, but what we recommend is that anybody who's ever had endometriosis or who has ongoing endometriosis, if they go on HRT, they've got to have a, they have got to go on a combined preparation combined. that has both estrogen and progesterone and not the estrogen on the HRT, even if they've had a hysterectomy. Well, I'm sure you've made the day of many women by saying HRT would be okay. Absolutely. So thank you for those really, really insightful answers. And as usual, you are amazingly articulate and clear in your explanations. Would it be okay if I asked you a couple of questions from listeners who Absolutely. have sent them in before? Absolutely. So to our listeners, I must stress at this point that it is very difficult to give specific and personalized advice to patients without a thorough knowledge of their past and current medical history, examination findings, etc. And also due to time constraints, I have summarized the questions in a way that I think retain the essence of what is being asked. Therefore, these answers should only be used as a guide and individualized care and medical management should be sought from your own doctor or gynecologist. So Eddie, the first question. Yeah. This patient has um, written in to say that she has severe endometriosis, which was diagnosed at nearly age 14. She had problems since she was nine. Um, and she says, I really wish there was a child and adolescent gynae when I was a child, <laughs> like me. Um, she also has positive, positive covariance syndrome. She has a family history of endometrial cancer in that her grandmother was diagnosed and six years ago and recently has had a recurrence. So she says she knows she's at increased risk, but every time she goes to see a doctor or ends up in A&E due to pain, it's put down to, oh, it's the endometriosis, which she says it probably is the, the endometriosis. However, she's always at the back of her mind worried about the future. She's had no recent changes and things are stable, but she says, what if she does have changes suggestive of endometrial cancer? How do I get professionals to understand that it's different and not the endometriosis so that any possible endometrial cancer is taken seriously? I hasten to add that I will um, do a podcast with Professor Emma Crosby who is a gynecological cancer specialist and her 
special area of expertise is endometrial cancer, womb cancer. Yeah. But would you like to give me your take on that? And I will ask Emma this question as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, 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 I think it's an important thing because a lot of women with endometriosis worry about cancer. And I think it's good to take the opportunity to reassure women that endometriosis is a benign condition. By benign, we mean it's a non-cancerous condition. Uh, and again, mm -hmm. I'll reassure this lady in her own um, individual case that we do not know of any significant correlation between endometriosis and endometrial cancer. Um, so I'm, I'm not aware of any connection at all between endometriosis and endometrial cancer. So there is no increased risk of endometrial cancer in women who have endometriosis. Now we know, we know that although endometriosis is a benign condition, in some very rare instances, we have found some cancer changes in long-standing endometriosis in some locations, especially the deeply infiltrating ones. Uh, and sometimes endometriosis that's been in the, in the ovaries and caused large ovarian cysts and been there for a very, very long time. Um, and fortunately, a lot, a lot, a, a lot of those, th those are very, very uncommon. I'll stress that they are, they are rare. So women should not be worrying that they're, uh, they're, they're going through cancerous changes in their endometriosis. And when those do occur, um, there's evidence from the imaging we do that can give an indication that that is the case. So from the MRI scans we do, they can see changes in the tissues that will give an indication that that's the case. Um, and usually um, when we've picked up those cancers, they are at very early stages. Um, that um, in a lot of the cases we do, the treatment we offer is sufficient to get rid of them. So. I would reassure people that endometriosis is not cancerous, it is benign. Uh, there's no connection between endometriosis and endometrial cancer. Uh, and in the very rare instances where <coughs> cancer has been found in long-standing endometriotic tissues, um, they're at very, very early stages and um, they're easily treated. Thank you. Our second question is for from a listener who she says is awaiting her first laparoscopy after having enduring 10 years of symptoms. She's had multiple admissions for pain while awaiting surgery. She wants to know, she's had a few questions, what can be done to educate GPs about endometriosis? I guess that the diagnosis has taken this long um, and that she, you know, she feels that um, she's waited so long. And is there any way that we can encourage the fact that women will be diagnosed earlier or referred earlier? This, this, this has been the bane of endometriosis. And I'd mm -hmm. like to reassure, reassure this lady that, um, unfortunately, uh, well, re re she, her story is not unique. All over the world, this is what we find with endometriosis, where there's a lag in the diagnosis of endometriosis. There's an, there's an, there's an eight year lag in the diagnosis of endometriosis in the UK and in Europe. And, and there's even a longer period of waiting in the United States. Uh, and that's because, you know, um, a lot of the time people either do not understand the condition uh, or people ascribe the condition to just um, normal, you know, um, female bodily functions and, get on with it um, or people just don't have the expertise to provide the treatment. So this has been going on and over recent years there has been a lot of um, activity to try and educate people including GPs, um, hospital doctors, um, nurses um, to be um, better informed about this condition more knowledgeable about it and be able to advise women appropriately. And I always throw this back at everybody that we all have a responsibility to um, increase people's awareness. Uh, I get invited to a lot of endometriosis forums to talk to women and I am as 
astounded when I go at the level of knowledge these women have. They understand how their bodies work. They understand a lot about endometriosis that, you know, even some um, doctors do not, you know, um, at a level that surpasses what some doctors have. So I always tell women um, and I encourage men to be empowered that, you know, if they, if they go to their doctors, women know their bodies. And if your body is not functioning the way you expect it to be functioning, and you go to your doctor and your doctor is um, not responding to your complaints, then you've got the right to insist that you want a second opinion. And, uh, and, yeah. and I always encourage women to be um, very, very, um, what's the word, assertive about wanting that second opinion and not to get fobbed off uh, by somebody telling their voice, just your bodily function. It's not your just bodily function. Yeah. It's, not, it's not normal for a period to stop you from going to work. It's not normal for a period to stop you from going to school. It's not normal not to be able to consummate your relationship because of pain. And if those things are happening to you and your GP is not taking you seriously, then request to speak to another doctor who, you know, hopefully will be able to take you more seriously. So I think we've all got a role to play in this. Uh, there's a lot of um, education going on now. There are loads of, um, of, I'm very, very pleased that there are loads of support groups, uh, endometriosis support groups all over the country. Uh, and they put on activities, um, they, they help to educate um, both doctors, nurses, and the general public. Uh, but everybody has a role to play, in, including this young lady who has um, posted the question. And including us today. <laughs> Absolutely. So she also mentions, and this is, I'm sure you hear this all the time as well, that patients are often, patients with endometriosis and many forms of chronic pain are often considered to be exaggerating pain symptoms. How can we educate GPs and other health professionals that endometriosis sufferers are not drug seeking and that the pain is valid? Very, very difficult. Again, education. Very difficult, but it's education. It's education. And it's education. everybody has a, right, a role to play in it. Uh, and I will encourage, and I will encourage women to actually um, take take control of their own destinies in a way. So if you go to your GP and your GP is not taking you seriously, then insist that you want to see somebody else. That's within their rights. I think sometimes we do not know what our rights are when it comes to you know healthcare delivery. It is perfectly reasonable for somebody to say, um, "I do not agree with your." assessment of my condition can i speak to somebody else and they, they 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 will need to provide you with that somebody else to get a second opinion so i would i would encourage women who feel they're not getting the right response from their doctors to ask for a second opinion and i mentioned before that <clears throat> why i thought of doing this podcast and my vision is that it's for patients to educate patients but equally, if it's used to educate general practitioners, junior doctors, Absolutely. other doctors from other specialties, nurses, then I think, I mean, it's really worth, worth our while and with the effort. So it's Absolutely. just about getting that message out there, however we can, um, and empowering patients, but empowering doctors as well with the information they need to, to do their job well, because I think everybody tries to do their job as, as best they can, yeah. And the limitation to that sometime is information. So hopefully we will help in that regard. Um, next question is, how can GPs be informed on how to best treat the pain in between surgeries or can pain clinics be set up? She goes on to say that Dr. Eddie Osagi is a very well respected, is very well respected, sorry, and a pioneer for endometriosis treatment. Are more gynecologists wanting to come forward to train under Dr. Eddie Osagi in this field? Oh, that's really kind. Thank you for, for saying that. For, fortunately, we, we, are, um, we are a BSG endometriosis center, so we have been training other gynecologists. So we always have trainees with us. At the moment, we've got two trainees yep. who are training to become endometriosis um, specialists. 
so yes we 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 are we we are training people um it, it, again is it it is a it is a difficult one because within within the confines of um nhs resources um ideally what you would want is for every um every city to have a BSG recognized endometriosis center that can yeah. coordinate the care of women within that locality. Um, but we, we just don't have that. Uh, and, um, and I think because of what we've alluded to earlier on about the knowledge of the condition and people not understanding how it evolves and how best to manage the symptoms that arise from it. Um, a lot of women are just um, left to self-manage themselves uh, or neglected, frankly. Uh, and anything we can do, again, it comes down to education and, you know, um, and everybody making the efforts, like what you're doing, Gail, and again, I'll congratulate you for doing this because any amount of information we put out there is useful. And even if we're just helping to change one person's attitude, one doctor's attitude, That's one nurse's it. attitude, you know, that will benefit lots, lots of um, so women who suffer with this condition. Okay, so finally, Eddie, you have seen, investigated, and operated on countless of patients with endometriosis. You are aware of and have supported many through their struggles with this condition. And I think that your investment and your empathy has come through so clearly during this conversation that, you know, men and male doctors can absolutely empathize and understand what women have to, have to go through. If you had the opportunity to say a couple of things to patients who have or may have endometriosis, what would you tell them? I think the absolute thing I would tell them, and I would, I would hope that if they take nothing away from this podcast, they take this away, um, is that endometriosis is not a hopeless condition, as a lot of people think it is. Um, I know people can be, lives can be blighted by endometriosis. I know, you know, fertility can be impacted. But we have come, we, we understand endometriosis a lot more than we did 15, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and we are all the time developing better ways of managing endometriosis. Um, so I'd like to leave them with some hope that although we do not fully understand endometriosis, but we'll understand enough about what it is to be able to help women, to be able to relieve them of pain, to be able to improve their fertility and to be able to give them a hope for a better future. Uh, and a lot of those treatments, a lot of those interventions are available at many centers. So if where they're going, they feel that they're not getting access to those interventions, then they need to look at elsewhere. And as I said, it's within their rights to request a second opinion, you know, and I encourage women to be empowered to challenge, you know, um, orthodoxy. So if somebody says, oh, it's just your period, get on with it, it's a woman thing, it is not. Be empowered to challenge them and you're within your right to do so. But endometriosis is treatable. Um, endometriosis is not a death sentence and endometriosis shouldn't confine you to a life of pain and misery. You've got to just take control and be assertive and make sure you get the care that's right for you. Thank you. Well, it only remains for me to thank you for your time and expertise today, Eddie. It was an even greater pleasure talking with you than I anticipated. And trust me, the bar was high. You've exceeded even my expectations and I've always been a fan. Thank you for supporting my podcast for being such an exceptional colleague and for providing so many years of excellent care to women with endometriosis. 
Thank you, Gail. Thank I you. really, I really, I really feel honored to be your first um, guest on this podcast, and I can, <laughs> I can, I can see that uh, it's very well thought of, thought about, and um, it's going to go places. So, congratulations on setting it up, and I wish you very, very, very best with it. Thank you. You're going you're gonna to be a hard act to follow. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not too sure, Gail. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having Take me. Take care. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Please keep your eyes and ears open for upcoming episodes. If you enjoyed this, please hit the like and subscribe buttons to raise awareness of this podcast.